all are having a wonderful Sabbath day. It is beautiful outside, but oh, it's hot. I'm ready. Judy said, we were talking on the way over here, I said, how far is it to the feast? And we're six weeks away. And believe it or not, six weeks is going to go by so fast. We're going to wake up one morning, the weather's going to be beautiful, and we're going to be hopefully on our way to the feast site this year. And uh, one of the feast sites, I hope you're planning, making plans to go. And I hope the weather's really good wherever you go. I imagine to Tahoe would be wonderful about feast time, and uh, it would be wonderful to be up there with those brethren up there. I'd like to, you know, extend our thank you to all the feast coordinators that are over the years have taken care of these feast sites, some of them without much relief. And, uh, and I know it's a, a tasking job to, to put on a feast and to coordinate all that and all the work that goes into it way ahead of time before the feast ever gets here. And then during the feast, you practically don't have a moment of, of rest while you're handling all of that. But I, I believe that all the feast sites are up and running and, and they're, they're making big plans to have a, a wonderful feast and schedules at each one of those. And I'm sure that uh, it'll be a wonderful time. In Genesis, the second chapter, verse 2, it says, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all of his work which God had created and made. We know that we read in the first chapter of the book of John, it tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That he was there with God in the beginning. And it was, of course, a reference there to Jesus Christ. And I believe that he was here in the Garden of Eden or prior to the man coming, uh, being formed out of the dust of the ground because God says on one occasion, let us make man in our image. Speaking, of course, of the duality of God, the Father and his Son who would become, who was the Jehovah of the Old, Wit Old Testament that would become someday Jesus Christ. But he set apart this specific time. He sanctified, and that's actually what the word means, sanctified it. And he ceased from working and creating. I would imagine that that was uh, quite a job when you look at all of creation and all of the animals and the beautiful. I like to see these photographs of these little birds. And every, it's almost every week I see a new one that I've never seen before, a little bird with all these fabulous colors. I see something in nature that fascinates me and my boss came into the, my office the other day, and I have little steps going up into my office and he, he, from out of doors. And he walked in, and he was shaking his hands. And I said, what's wrong? He said, I put my hand on one of those locusts out there, you know, on the handrail. And of course, it was one of those big cicadas, if you've ever seen them, big army green bugs about that big, freaked him out a little bit. But they're kind of cute when you look at them. Their big old eyes are way out on each side over here. And and they're harmless, but they're a little creepy if you don't expect it. But um, the intricacy, if you look at them and their transparent wings and the idea that they go underground as a, a larva and live there for 17 years before they actually come up and you see their little skins, they, they, they shed their exoskeleton as it's called and uh, you see them hanging on your f lawn furniture outside, a little dried up little skeleton looking thing out there. And, and you know that these little creatures were designed by God. And every other animal, fascinating, all the zoos that we've been in in our lifetime and, and, and the uh, interesting creatures we've seen God created. And he rested from all of that. In Exodus the 16th chapter, if you'll turn over with me just a few pages here in Exodus 16, he sort of created what was called a preparation day of sorts. You remember when the nation of Israel came out of the land of Egypt? God brought them out in the, in the wilderness and they you know, went through the Red Sea and then all of a sudden somebody started thinking about food. I would imagine somebody started thinking about food long before they went through the, through the Red Sea. Or maybe they had some provisions that were about to run out. How long could you carry food for your whole family? And, and how long would it last? You know, it took them several days to get to the Red Sea and through the Red Sea. And then all of a sudden they're out in the wilderness and realize, man, we're out here camping out with no gear, no provisions. And, of course, God rained down manna from heaven. Now think about that. What a fabulous miracle. 
Exodus 16 chapter, down in verse 5, he says, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? That they will walk in his law. I would ask you the question today or those listening to this, is this going to be a test for you? And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day, notice that, they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So on the sixth day, twice as much bread would fall. Each family was to gather twice as much for their families. And why? Well, we, we read that when the Sabbath day occurred or the seventh day occurred, they walked out there and there was no bread on the ground. How about that? What, that all by itself, not only was the manna a miracle, but the fact that there was twice as much on the sixth day was another miracle. And another miracle was that there was none on the seventh day. Of course, there was the hard heads and the stubborn folks and the rebellious that went out on the Sabbath day and looked and, oh, well, there's no food out here today, even after God told them to, to gather twice as much. You know, human beings are the most hard-headed of all the creatures. I, I don't know you, if you've ever had a mule or a donkey or a horse. Some of those can be awful stubborn, but I believe human beings take the cake when it comes to rebellion and stubbornness. When they see and they have the ability to understand what God is telling them. And, of course, they went out there and there was no manna. But God was sort of laying the groundwork for this preparation day of preparing yourself for the Sabbath day. In Exodus 29, over just a few pages here, Exodus 29, down in verse 8, look at this. Exodus 29, I hope I have the right, uh, I don't think I have the right scripture on this one. Um, I'm going to go back here because I know where it's at. <laughs> it's Exodus 20 is where it's at. Because that's where God wrote with his own finger the um, laws that he gave to Moses there on Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai, which is very interesting because, you know, God brought Moses up there on Mount Sinai and he wrote with his own finger. And I know you remember the uh, movie, The Ten Commandments, where they sort of portrayed that. And they've tried to portray that in a couple of different movies. But here God wrote with his own finger on tables of stone. Look what it says down in verse 4. Uh, let's see. And you shall make unto you any graven images, and look at down in verse, uh, the fourth commandment, down in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That was the point I wanted to make. He's telling them to remember the Sabbath day because I created it at creation. He's looking back at creation, and he's telling those folks, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days... Shall you labor and do all your work? You have six days. You know, the number of six in the Bible sort of portrays man, his number. But the seventh day is God's day, God's number. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do, not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter. So you obviously have to teach your children about the Sabbath day. Your manservant or your maidservant. I've always told people it's everything that's under your control you know, you, you don't, if you've got a labor force there, they, they need to rest as well. Your cattle, your stranger that is within your gates, you know, if you have farm animals and plowing, you know, back then they had plowing animals, they let them rest as well. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So not only did he set it apart, sanctify it, now he makes it, Holy. This day is holy. He sanctified it and he hallowed it. Uh, over in uh, Exodus, the 31st chapter here, it wasn't, he makes a statement here about the Sabbath day. And I'm going to skip through some of these. A lot more information here. If you've ever done what I did when I was first converted and came into the church of God uh, as an adult, I grew up in the church. I was in the church since I was five years old. But I was about 22 or 23 years old when I really was converted in my mind and heart and believe and began to study. And one of the things I did was go through the Bible and look at every verse in the Bible where the word, word Sabbath is mentioned and prove for myself what does the 
what does the Word of God actually say about the Sabbath day? When and where and how and who should observe it? All of those things, and you ought to do that. I took it upon myself to mark all of those verses in red in my old Bible. I don't even carry it with me anymore. It's so falling apart. But this one here, I've done the same thing. And as I did this morning, I looked at everyone. I didn't read them all, but I looked at every one of those scriptures this morning early as I scanned through all of the scriptures that mention the Sabbath day. But look what it says here in Exodus 31. Down in verse, uh, let me see, 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses, speak unto the children of Israel, and say, Verily, my Sabbaths, that's a plural word there, my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you. Oh, wait a minute. A sign between me and you. In other words, God is saying, this is the sign that will identify who my people are. Throughout your generation that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. So not only did he sanctify this day, he's saying this is setting you apart. And believe me, it truly does. In this world today, when you keep the Sabbath day, you are apart from the world, aren't you? If you don't believe that, try keeping the Sabbath day diligently when it comes to your job and, uh, and people in the world that want you to do things on the Sabbath day. I had phone calls this morning from work. I tell the guys at work I can't take phone calls on the Sabbath day, and they still call me anyway. Call me right now. I need to talk to you. I just ignore it, and I'll, tell, I'll call them tomorrow and tell them, look, I'm sorry, and I'll remind them again I can't take phone calls because, you know, we go to church on Saturday and this is the Sabbath day that we observe. And it's, it's difficult, always. You know, they forget that you keep the Sabbath day and you can't work late on Friday night. He says uh, that your generations may know that I am the Lord your, that do sanctify. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defiles it shall surely be put to death. And, of course, that was the... You know, the penalty right away, if you read the story about the man that went out and picked up sticks on the Sabbath day, and uh, that's listed over in uh, Numbers 15th chapter. I won't turn there, but you know, God said, don't kindle a fire on the Sabbath day. Why? Because you got to go out and gather wood and chop wood, and it was all a laborious thing to do to gather up all the fire and utensils and get ready to, to build a fire so they could cook and all of that. And God said, no, today's different. And this stubborn old man walked out there and decided, watch this. I wonder if I can get away with going out and picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. And they brought him before Moses, and they made a judgment about his rebellion, obviously flagrant rebellion against God in front of everybody. And so they made a, an example out of him and stoned him to death as a result. It was an instant justice, but... It says, you shall keep my Sabbath, anyone that does that will put to death. But I'll look down in verse 15. Six days may work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It's never going to end. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. In the book of Nehemiah, I want to go over here because, well, let me, before I do that, I want to turn to Leviticus 23. I read this usually every time uh, during the holy day season of the year. By the way, September's coming up. We're going to have, of course, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, the, you know, and of course the the Feast of Tabernacles and the Last Great Day, who are mentioned right here in this chapter here of all the holy days that were to observe throughout the year. And the very first one that's mentioned, look in Leviticus 23, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning my feast. Not the feast of the Jews, have I heard people, and even commentators and writers. I was sitting there looking this morning in my concordance. I have a couple of different ones. Of course, I have the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, and that thing's about that thick and a big giant book. And you can't hardly pick it up early in the morning. I'm like, I don't want to pick that thing up. It's so heavy. Even though I did and looked up all those scriptures this morning, I have a smaller one that's more of a book volume, maybe an encyclopedic volume of a, a encyclopedia. And I looked through it, and some of these uh, references that I looked up, like Sabbath day, I said, this is not fair. It's not right. It's impartial. 
because they skip a lot of the main scriptures that I'm reading here today. Why do they do that? Because of preconceived ideas about the Sabbath day, that they should be keeping Sunday. Is that why they did not list him in a concordance that's supposed to list all of the general references about the Sabbath day or the law or various other? And it makes me realize i got to be careful even using these study helps because they're biased. They skip scriptures. It's like, why didn't they mention that? One of the obvious scriptures, many of them, he says here concerning the feast of the Lord, which he proclaimed to be holy convocations, even these are my feast, the feast of the Lord. Six days, the very first one he mentions, shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is a Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. The very first one on the top of all of these major annual holy days is the Sabbath day. In Nehemiah, the 13th chapter, I wanted to go there because when they returned back from the land of Babylon, when they were carried away captive, uh, the nation of Judah in the south that was carried away captive, they came back after 70 years of captivity in Babylon. They returned to Jerusalem. They rebuilt the wall in the days of Nehemiah and Esther. They rebuilt the temple, and they laid the foundation of the temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And they started to get back into their old habits again. In Nehemiah, in the 15th chapter, let me see if I'm, I'm not 15, chapter 13 and verse 15, he says, In those days I saw in, Jerus in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and lading asses and also wine, grapes, and figs and many other burdens. So they were, they were having a market, you know, a farm, farm, farmer's market, maybe something like that. People bringing in, you know, all these goods and people were buying and selling. And it was just, it was obviously something that Nehemiah saw that was happening on the Sabbath day and he didn't think it was right. And he said, and also wines, grapes, and burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold these, this merchandise. And, uh, of course, they, there were outsiders that had realized, hey, there's a group of folks living in Jerusalem now that are Judah, of the tribe of Judah. And so these people from Tyre brought in fish and all manner of wear and sold on the Sabbath day unto the children of Judah and Jerusalem. Nehemiah got so aggravated with this that he closed the city gates. And, of course, there was an outcry. Well, how dare you? This is, you know, this is how we make our income. And, I mean, he about just had to threaten these people that if you do this again, you're going you're gonna to suffer some dire consequences. And so he shut the gates, and he made them obey the original intent of the commandment to rest on the Sabbath day and stop all of this. It, it wasn't, they were obviously missing the point, and he knew that if he didn't put an end to it, then they would gradually over time begin to slip farther and farther away from the Sabbath day until they were completely oblivious to it. That has happened in the 20th century and in the 21st century. I've seen it with my own eyes, people that slowly drift away from the Sabbath day, which is the very foundational doctrine of our faith, one of the very foundation stones of what identifies us and separates us from the world. And, you know, and God calls us, you know, it's like a covenant that we make with him when we observe and honor and obey the Sabbath day. I won't read it. David wrote in Psalm 92 a whole psalm dedicated to the Sabbath day. It's called the Psalm for the Sabbath day. In Isaiah, the eighth chapter, we'll go hear the wonderful prophet Isaiah. He has so much knowledge. It would be interesting to see what he looked like. I've often dreamed of what kind of man he was, the life that he lived, the brilliant writing that he wrote over, you know, this big lengthy book that he wrote and all the subjects he covered. He must have been a very knowledgeable fellow and uh, very uh, in tune with history and, then of course, the history of the nation of Israel and Judah, but also with the surrounding countries around him, but also he was very in tune with the Word of God and what it said and God's calling for him. And in Isaiah the 8th chapter and down in verse 20, he says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. I read that, I read that scripture because... 
a lot of people have opinions about the Bible. They have a lot of uh, traditions that they keep. You know, Jesus dealt with it, that. He says that they observe the traditions of men more than the commandments of God. He dealt with that with the Pharisees. But here Isaiah is saying if they don't speak, if they don't speak according to this word, and what was the only word Isaiah had? None of the New Testament had ever been written. He was talking about the, the, the law, Moses' writings, the first five books of the Bible, probably some of the others may have been written by then, but the history of the kings and the chronicles that were written and, and recorded, Ezra and Nehemiah, but certainly not, um, well, not Ezra and Nehemiah, because that even came later, because Isaiah wrote before the northern tribes of Israel were carried away captive by the Assyrians in 721, I believe it was. So here we see this prophet saying that it's a, it has to be according to this word, or there's no light in them. Later in that chapter in Isaiah 56, he says, he writes about the Sabbath day in particular. And I want to rec write, read what he said here. Isaiah 56 in verse 1. Thus says the Lord, keep judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come. I like that. I, I like to tell people, you know, it, you're not going to have it all figured out. You know, Jesus said on one occasion, I will set everything in order when I come. But he tells us, you know, Apostle Paul remind us to hold fast to the faith that was once delivered to the saints. You're not going to have it all figured out, but you can have this great uh, conviction about certain things that you know to be truth. And he's t Paul would tell us to hang on to those things and don't let those go. Blessed is a man, verse 2, that does this, and the son of man that lays hold on it, that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it, and keeps his hand from doing evil. Neither let the son of a stranger that joins himself to the Lord say, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I'm a dry tree. So a foreigner that comes in that wasn't an Israelite says, I can't even be a part of that because I'm not a part of the nation of Israel. And he says, don't let him say that. For this, for thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath. A pagan that lived in a pagan country half a world away that never knew anything about the history of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If he were to do this, listen to what it says, and choose the thing that pleased me and take hold of my covenant, the one we just read about, even unto them will I give in my house and within my walls a place a name better than sons and daughters, and I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off, and the sons of the strangers that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to, keep his, to be his servants, every one that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain." and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifice shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. So here is this foreigner who decides one day, you know, I understand about the seventh day Sabbath, I think I'm going to start keeping it. It's automatic blessings that rain down upon him as a result. Over a few pages here, to next page to Isaiah 58 and verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. We try to do that in the, word, in the work of God over and over again, week after week, with the television, you know, the, the outreach program that we have over the Internet and the magazines and articles that we write and the sermons that we give. And it goes in here talking about religion. Here Isaiah is talking about the description of true religion when it had, you know, he, he talks about fasting and if you've afflicted yourself, he talks about losing the, loosing the bands of wickedness in your life, undo the heavy burden. And later on he talks about the hungry, the poor, the fatherless, and the widows. I mentioned last night on a, in a telephone conversation with a young man that I talked to about people that think doctrine is where it's at. They want to argue and fight over doctrine. And doctrine is not where it's at. And I'll, I've even asked some people before that want to fight over Scripture, how many widows do you have in your area? How many poor? 
How many fatherless do you have? Oh, I don't know. Let's get back to this argument here. No. God says that we're to do those things. The rest he will set in order when he comes if we don't completely understand it all. He says, then shall the light break forth in the morning and thine health shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before me. The glory of the Lord shall be your, your rear guard, your rear reward, as, as it says here. And uh, he says down in verse 12, and they shall... And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. This is talking sort of prophetically here about the second coming of Christ when they're going to rebuild these old waste cities and you shall rise up foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in if you will turn away your foot from the Sabbath from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, calling the Sabbath day a delight. I really want to emphasize that because later on we'll see that the Sabbath day became a horrible burden for people, terrified of actually thinking they were breaking the Sabbath day because of what the Pharisees had enlisted the people into believing what was the Sabbath day. And that's why Jesus came when they, they had so many problems with Jesus is because what he was doing on the Sabbath day didn't fit into their idea of what the Sabbath day truly was And yet, we'll see what he says about that in a moment. He says, doing your pleasure on the Sabbath day, calling the Sabbath day a delight, like Mark said this morning. You get up on a Sabbath morning, go outside. Man, you don't have work to worry about. (laughs) You rest, you feel the breeze on your face, and you look at the nature out there and you know, praise God for his glory. Go read what David wrote about the Sabbath day. He said, I know that all of my enemies are going to be put down. And I know that you created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in him is. And he says, you know, he talks about God in ways that we can't even describe ourselves sometimes. That we stand in the shadow of your might and your wings are outspread over us. And we're like little chickens, you know, baby chicks in the, in the, in, under the wings of the mother hen. That's the way God protects and loves us. The Holy, uh, I'm going to skip down to verse 14. Then shall you delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. It almost instantaneous blessings as a result. I want to get quickly to the New Testament, Matthew, the 12th chapter, uh, verse 1, Matthew 12 and verse 1. And at time went on. Uh, at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and the disciples were hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn to eat. This is what I was mentioning here. Of course, the Pharisees saw that and said, "Behold, this disciple, what, you know, it's unlawful for you to do this on the Sabbath. You can't pick a grain of corn off and put it in your mouth on the Sabbath day, because they decided they read those scriptures about you know." not having your animals harvest or plow or anything, and they took it down to the most minuscule uh, place. And, of course, David, uh, Jesus said, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry when it, uh, and those that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread that was not lawful for them? You know, he gives these examples where, you know, it, <laughs> it customs and... And the things having to do with the temple were one thing. Keeping God's Sabbath day was another. But there, was, there were exceptions to this hard, rigorous rules that the Pharisees had set on people. I mean, those people were so afraid they, were, they wouldn't even walk out of their house. Because they were afraid it, if I walked too far, I would be breaking the Sabbath day. And of course, over and over again, they, they chided Jesus for not only this eating on the Sabbath day, plucking ears of corn. Oh, you're harvesting. No, I'm not. We're walking through the, through the, uh, you know, the field here, just plucking ears of corn, probably talking and laughing with his disciples and enjoying the Sabbath day, but also healing on the Sabbath day. They felt that because he was healing someone, he had somehow broken the, the Sabbath day. Chapter, I want to go now to, um, I want to read here what I wrote. Did Jesus do away with the Sabbath day? Or did he break the traditions of men that were corrupting and distorting the true intent of the Sabbath day? Did people enjoy the Sabbath day during Jesus' day? Well, the people that were under the Pharisees didn't. They were afraid. They were scared to death that they would break the Sabbath day. 
Was it a delight to them? And I have to say, no. If you read the way the Pharisees looked at it and they treated people, it, wouldn't have, it would have been a miserable day. Or had it become a burden to be feared, Jesus tore down these burdensome walls and brought the Sabbath day back into clear view for the people and its true intent. And what was that? So that they could rest and have tranquility and peace of mind for a change. Mark 2 and verse 27 Mark 2 and verse 27. And he said unto them, again, this is a time when he was going through the cornfields and he was plucking the ears of corns. But on this occasion, he says, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath God created for man. Not a... Uh, Something that man was supposed to be afraid of, you know. It was made for him to rest and relax and to enjoy. But the Pharisees were so ingrained with their tradition that they wouldn't be... You know, when after this point here, when he healed a man on the Sabbath day, they plotted his murder as a result. Now that's how rotten they were to the core, that they were willing to kill an innocent man. Mark, the third chapter, verse 1, and he entered again, he entered, this is speaking of Jesus, and he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man with a withered hand, and they watched him, you know, whether he was going to do anything or not. Of course, he healed the man. And look down at verse 6, and the Pharisees went forth straightway and took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Chapter 6 and verse 23 we just want to give a couple examples here. And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. Uh, 6 down in verse 23. I'm going to get ahead of here a little bit. Um, is that the right scripture? Mark 6, verse 23. Um, oh, no, I, it was chapter 6 and verse 2 and 3. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished at his sayings. From whence hath this man these sayings? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him? And even such mighty works are wrought by his hand. Of course, they said, isn't this, you know, the, the son of Mary and, and, and uh, James, Joseph, and Judah, and Simon, his brothers, and his sisters, aren't they here? He's just a, a local yokel here. And yet, he's going into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. In Luke, the fourth chapter, we'll look at a couple examples here. I probably shouldn't have written so many down here, but Luke, the fourth chapter, verse 16, and he came to Nazareth, Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. I'm going to skip to Acts, the 13th chapter, if you would, with me, because I want to give a couple of examples here of the Apostle Paul, chapter 13 of the book of Acts. Down in verse 14, Acts 13 and verse 14. And we're going to run through these quite, quite quickly here if you don't, if you will allow me. Acts 13 verse 14, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch of Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Here's Paul. Now this is years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here the Apostle Paul is on his, these missionary journeys going around uh, the area uh, there um, in um, this Asia Minor area where he was introducing into these synagogues the gospel of Jesus Christ for which he was called. You remember he was struck down on the road to Damascus and God told him, you're going to go to the far ends of the earth. You're going to eventually go to Rome, all the way to Rome. And he did. Uh, Acts the down in verse 42, that same chapter, 40. Two. Let me see if I got the right. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these might words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Interesting language there, and I only bring this up because it's Saturday. They're in a Jewish synagogue. Paul's preaching. The Gentiles, who had never kept the Sabbath day, were there to hear Paul, this man from out of town, this preacher, this evangelist. And the Jews leave. Paul doesn't say, you guys can come back tomorrow on Sunday morning and we could talk. It says, no, they waited till the next Sabbath day. 
Now, when the congregation was broken up, and many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day, almost the whole city to, to came together to hear the word of God. I like that. Man, I would love to go into a city and stand up and preach. And next week, I was going to be there for seven days, and a whole city shows up. That must have been exhilarating beyond belief. People were hungry and thirsty for the true words of God, the truth of God about the Sabbath day. And a lot of these were Gentiles. They'd never heard about it. So they were eager and, and hungry for the word of God. They wanted to hear it. And, of course, the Jews believed that they were stirring up the whole city and they you know, wanted to have them arrested and eventually probably did. Acts, the 15th chapter, uh, verse 21 Acts 15, verse 21, And Moses of old hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogue every Sabbath day. And, of course, this was the Jerusalem conference where major ministers like Peter and, and James and John were there, uh, the apostles, but also others were there, probably 120. I don't know how many were there. But uh, Paul was there, and they were talking about the idea that these Gentiles should be circumcised. And, of course, they came to the agreement that, that it was necessary for these Gentiles to be circumcised, but that, that we write unto them and that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood, the rest they will learn in the synagogues where the law of Moses is read every Sabbath day. In uh, chapter 16 and verse 13, he says, And on the Sabbath day we went out of the city by the riverside. This is when they were uh, in Philippi. And he said, and prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women and that resorted there. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us. And of course, here on again on the Sabbath day, they listened or they came out to preach uh, and met Lydia there, who would later on become a you know probably a, an instrument in the church. In chapter 17, it says, Paul, as his manner was, went in the synagogue on the Sabbath day over and over again. You know, Paul, on a number of occasions, I mentioned the, the, to the, these to you in times past, it says that he wanted to keep the feast which was at Jerusalem. He desired to keep the feast which, which comes at Jerusalem. And, of course, we know that he mentioned in his writings in, the, in 1 Corinthians, he says, as you are unleavened, you know, he talked about Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. And as you are unleavened, he, we understand that he wrote that letter for them to be uh, read that letter in front of those congregations during the, the days of unleavened bread, which were holy days. Paul determined to be in Jerusalem by Pentecost on one occasion. And remember when he was sailing to Rome, it said the fast had already passed. And he was referring to the Day of Atonement. You know, he knew that sailing was going to be treacherous because it was late in the year, in the autumn of the year. And he was going to sail all the way across the Mediterranean Sea there when the storms were will to, to stir up. And, of course, they didn't listen to him, and they lost their ship on the island of Malta. Uh, in Acts, the 20th chapter, he said, We sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, over and over in these uh, references. Is the law done away? My time is out. I probably should stop here and do a part two of this, but I really wanted to mention to you all the some of the references that I didn't want to go into a whole sermon about is the law done away. Maybe I'll save that for part two. I'm going to skip ahead here in my notes because, you know, Jesus wrote... If a man will enter into life, he will keep the commandments. That's what the rich man asked him. And there are prophecies having to do with the, with the Sabbath day. We know that in the book of Revelation it tells us that we're going to be kings and priests and we'll reign uh, with him on the, or on the earth. But it also talks about you know, the Satan was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Christ. Here are prophecies that are looking out there in the future of the final remnant of the church of God that is going to be keeping the laws of God, 
but they're also going to be keeping the Sabbath day. We know that when you read in the book of uh, Isaiah, the second chapter, where it talks about the Feast of Tabernacles and the millennial reign of Jesus Christ when he returns to this earth, and it says the law shall go forth out of Zion. Over and over again, this reference to God's law in, uh, in the uh, Zechariah, the uh, 14th chapter, where it talks about keeping the feast in that day. At his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. And then every year they will go up from year to year to keep the Feast of Tabernacles in the millennium with Jesus Christ on this earth. Over and over again, there's many, many proofs and facts out there if you care to look and understand what the Word of God says. There's some interesting books. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have one, a copy of each of these. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they're named the same name, so when you look them up, you might not be able to find them. But one of them is Samuel Bakioki's book. Is from Sabbath to Sunday, if you care to look into what, how we went from keeping the seventh day Sabbath on Saturday, which some people believe is lost, and he explains all of this beautifully in the book, to Sunday worship. Did ancient Rome have anything to do with our observance in the Protestant world of keeping Sunday for the Sabbath day? You know, the Protestants and the Roman Catholic Church have about four or five scriptures. I wish I had time. Maybe I can do that next time. That they use as proof that Sunday should be kept out of the Bible. And when you look at them, you think, what a pitiful case. What a pitiful case. This is the evidence that you bring forth out of the hundreds of scriptures. And I could have read hundreds of them to you today out of the Sabbath day. They have these four little scriptures that are vague. And they're, you know, three times removed from the subject matter to use as evidence that this is why we should keep Saturday, Sunday for Saturday as the Sabbath day, what is, when the Bible absolutely tells us the exact opposite. Samuel Bakioki, the book From Sabbath to Sunday, we have a book also here <coughs> about the Sabbath day is the Sabbath day for Christians. Carl Carlisle B. Hayes wrote another book that was called From Sabbath to Sunday, and I have it as well. Both these guys go through all of the reasoning and all the answers and the questions and the, and the reasons behind people's excuses for keeping Sunday and how it transformed over time, how it eroded away because of the Roman Catholic Church. That really, you know, these ancient emperors who were sun worshipers wanted to appease these pagans who kept Sunday... And so at one point in time, they had both Saturday and Sunday that they observed, and they were trying to get rid of all this Jewishness. And as a result, what erupted and what ended up was the observance of Sunday, which the Protestant church came out of the Roman Catholic church, and they brought with her these doctrines that had to do with Sunday. And I'd like to just remind everybody, today is the Sabbath day. And I hope you have a wonderful Saturday.